want to challenge you to open your heart. Uh, let your faith soar today. And whatever is your need, I do believe in my heart that God will speak to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our scripture today is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. Let's read together. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. Body is not meant for immorality, but the body for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Just want to repeat those that I've highlighted and read. The body for the Lord, the Lord for the body. Father, we thank you today for your precious word. But words without your spirit will kill. For that's what the letter does, kills. But we are here to receive life. And we recognize that it's the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, upon your word that will bring life and health and energy and strength and comfort and hope. And so I ask you, O God, that the anointing of God will flow freely through thy servant today from the throne of God. I pray, O Father, in the name of Jesus, that nothing from the throne will be lost in translation as it flows to your people. Almighty God. Have your way this morning. I come against every lingering work of darkness. I come against every foul spirit and I drive them from this place today. And I declare this place sanctified and holy unto the Lord. And God, I come against every thought, every imagination... That is competing with the voice of God today. And I bring them into subjection to the Holy Spirit today. That our hearts and our minds will be on the frequency on which God is transmitting today. And nothing will distract us, O God. That your word will not be lost. But it will accomplish that which you please. Have your way and break into our spirits today. And teach us that, oh God, that our lives might be well-pleasing to you. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. And we thank you. Amen. Praise. We talked about the fact that when God brought the Hebrews out of Egypt, the moment they came out of Egypt, the moment they were out of the land of Egypt, they had crossed the Red Sea, God gathered them at the foot of Sinai, and he called Moses to meet him at the top of the mountain. The people gathered around the foot of Sinai, waiting there as Moses went up and communed with God and waited upon him for the commandments. God gave him all the commandments and all the instructions. God gave him the laws. God gave them many, many things concerning the life and the conduct of his people. How now that they were out of Egypt, they were expected to live. Among all the instructions and the laws, God gave them the pattern of a temple, of a tabernacle, or a temple that he wanted to build, that he wanted Moses to build, so the people could gather to worship, and that their journeying will be centered around that tabernacle. And God gave the instructions In the book of Exodus, you can read chapter 26 onwards to 35, God spent enormous amount of resources and time to very, very meticulously and give give all the designs of the tabernacle. There was no input from man. There was no room for human innovation. It all came from God, and God was clear that I want nothing taken away, nothing added, you're going to build it exactly like I ordered. And God anointed men like Oholiab and Bezalel in order to accomplish the task of building the tabernacle. 
The thing about the tabernacle that we noted was that it was a tripart structure. It was, it consisted of an outer court where the people gathered. And in that outer court, there were two pieces of furnishing. One was the brazen altar upon which hung the sacrifices. And going past that brazen altar, you ran into a laver that had water, a basin of water that the people cleansed themselves in. So there was one door into this tabernacle, speaking about the exclusive way to meet God is only through Christ. In a moment you got through that door, you ran into this altar, and that's the altar where the people have brought their sacrifices. The priests, they were priests in the outer court. They killed those sacrifices. And at the four corners of that altar were horns. And as they killed the sacrifice, they hung the sacrifice on those on those horns, and the blood just dripped down. And then the people would move, and the priests would go to the altar of cleansing, the laver of cleansing, and they would wash and be clean. So they entered through the one door, accepting the sacrifice which pointed to the cross of Jesus Christ, and then two words, cleansing. Cleansing in the blood, and being washed and regenerated by the word, before we, we are accepted into the presence of God. Then there was the holy place, and the holy place the priests ministered. And in the holy place, on one side was a table of showbread, on the other side was a candelabra, and to the far end, there was where it separated from the holiest of all, was a veil, a curtain like this. And interestingly, folks, I was here Friday, and I was having a time of prayer in the presence of the Lord, and something caught my attention here. About, about this whole structure. And, and, you know, I looked at it and I thought about how prophetic all of this was when we were doing it. We were not even aware. But many churches have this veil running right through. But here in this church, it is separated and is separated by the cross. It's an opening that was created. And that points, of course, to what happened at Calvary. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But there was a veil that separated the holy place from the holiest of all. So to get you the picture again, this here sanctuary, imagine this is the holy place. The table of shoe bread was there. The candelabra was there. Right up here at the, at, the, at, the, at the edge of the veil was the altar of incense, which speaks about supplication and prayer. And the priests would offer their incense to the Lord there. And then beyond that veil was that little section called the holiest of all. And that's the place where God came and met with the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. God did not come into this place. He did not come in the outer court. He came only in that place. As we move along through salvation history, we found that this whole temple and the mindset of God was not something that the temple was not just an ordinary structure. It was a picture. Like everything else in the Old Testament, it pointed to Christ. As Jesus said, search the scriptures, and you will see they speak of me. Jesus, on another occasion, said, Moses wrote of me. Now, if you go through the books of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy, do you see me, Moses mentioning Jesus Christ? Not at all. He doesn't mention the name. Yet Jesus says, Moses wrote of me. In other words, he's saying that all that Moses wrote, the typical symbolism, it speaks to some aspect of my life, of the life of Jesus the work of Jesus, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and so on. So all of these things that were built, the instructions that God gave to Moses that he wrote down, they pointed in some way, shape, or form to the life, the death, the resurrection, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we move along, we find that the temple now moved from the tabernacle to the temple of Solomon, and then eventually to the human being as the temple of God. God is saying, now you are the temples of the living God. And then we see that just as the temple and the tabernacle was this triparty structure that had the holiest of all, the holy place and the outer court, we see the correspondence in the human temple. That the human being is the fulfillment of that temple. That the holiest of all corresponds to our spirit. The holy place corresponds to our soul. And the outer court corresponds to the human body. So we have that, we are fulfilling 
that structure. We are now the temple of God. And this is why, because the Holy Spirit, the presence of God came only in the holiest of all, this is why God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. God does not come into our soul. God is not to be found in our bodies. God is only found in our spirit. That's the place we meet with God. And so unless we can break through the crowd and the obstacles of the outer court and get past the soulish realm of our being, we will never access God. They that worship God must worship in spirit. We must enter into that realm because that's the place where we will find God. He does not come in any other place. And so, having established that, I want to speak a little bit about this outer court today. Another day, I'll speak about the holy place. And then we will talk again about the spirit. We'll talk about the holiest of all, the human spirit. The Bible says to know yourself, to know yourself. And often when we hear that, we wonder what it means. We, we know it's generally to have an understanding of my ways and how I think and how I act, how I respond to certain situations, to know yourself. But to know yourself, I think it goes a little, a little bit deeper. Because, first of all, we need to understand our construction. If I am to know a car, I need to understand what a car is, what the components that make up that car, and how it works. And I, I, you know, I discover that the human being is complex. It is complex. But God wants us to know ourselves. He wants us to understand who we are, how we are made. David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He had an idea of the construct of the human being. And you're asking me today, you say, why do I need to know that? Well, for this very reason. For example, we don't understand that God is only found in my spirit. I need to understand my spirit. How do I access my spirit? How do I move beyond the outer realm of, of the flesh and get past the, the soul, which is the seat of my intellect and my emotion and my will? How do I move beyond all of this and to access? Jesus opened the access into the holiest of all. I mentioned to you that when Jesus died on Calvary, there was an earthquake. And that earthquake shook the place. It shook the place. And imagine, in that temple, you have furniture. You have a candlestick with candles and that are lit. An earthquake shook the place and did not dismantle that candlestick, did not dismantle the shoe bread. He did not knock over anything else. The only thing that changed in the temple when the earthquake shook, the Bible says that the veil was torn in two, opening up access into the holiest of all. The once forbidden territory, the once the one territory that was accessible only to the high priest is now opened up through the veil that is the flesh of Jesus Christ that was crucified. So we now have access. And so the significant thing about the crucifixion, about the death of Jesus Christ, if we are to say what significant happened, what, what happened that was significant, nothing changed. God did not dismantle the temple. He did not dismantle the furnishings. The only change that occurred from the death of Jesus Christ was access was opened into the holiest of all. But how do we get there? How do we Jesus has parted the curtains. But how do we get there? We need to understand the human self. We need to understand ourselves. And that's what we are trying to get at in these next couple of weeks. If we understand ourselves, we will be able to function more effectively for God. And so I want to talk about this body. I want to talk about its outer court. Can I go back to my original slide? I want to talk about its outer court, this body. What is the purpose of the body? When I was in Bible school 30-something years ago, <clears throat> I remember one night, how I was feeling very sluggish in one particular period um, of my life around that time. Very, very sluggish. I would fall asleep when I'm trying to study. Uh, I've struggled to stay awake and Bible study in, in, in classes. Um, 
at work. It was a struggle after lunch. It was just like I was just uh, lethargic. I, I didn't know what was happening. So I remember asking my teacher, one of the teachers, he was a really senior, well, uh, spiritual man. And I asked him, I said, you do you think I need exercise? And he said, oh, no, you don't need exercise. You need spiritual exercise only. That's all we need. Well, his, his, his response betrays a general thinking among Christians with regards to the body. The moment we are saved, it seems we, we became imbalanced. Suddenly, the spirit took prominence in our lives, and the development of the spiritual man took prominence in our lives. We, we became this heavenly-minded, no earthly good kind of, kind of people. Because so much imbalance took place. All of a sudden, there was all about heaven, it's all about Bible, it's all about God. And it seems as though that the body had nothing uh, of worth. And therefore should not be given too much time and resources on it. So, <clears throat> just an unnecessary burden to the spirit. So the question I want to address this morning include, what is the place of the human body in spiritual service? What is the place of the human body in spiritual service? Is the body of any value to the Lord? And if so, how can we use the body to glorify God? Well, our text, our text gives us some vital information on the use of the body. And I want you, as we talk about the body, to keep and part, a little part of your mind tucked away the outer court. Because the body corresponds, remember, to the outer court. The body. The text that we read says, The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So these are the two statements we want to examine today. Because I believe these speak to us poignantly, and, and, and very instructively towards the use of the body. The Lord for the body, and the body for the Lord. The Lord is for the body. This is a powerful statement. God is for my body. And the first reason we know that the Lord is for the body is that he made it. We are different from angels in that we have a body. God made this body from the dust of the earth, but he made this body. And then he breathed into this body the pneuma, which is the spirit of God. And man became a living soul. We're not told that God made the soul. Follow me. God made the body out of the dust of the earth. So he formed Adam, but Adam was like a shell. And then God breathed into him. God breathed into him the pneuma. That's the word used there. He breathed into him his spirit. And Adam became a living soul. So as a result of the spirit entering the body, the pneuma entering the sarks, a soul was formed. And the soul became the medium by which the spirit interacted with the body. The spirit does not move the body. The soul moves the body. The soul is the intermediary, the medium that came as a result of these two composite forces. And so everything that the body does is supposed to be driven by the soul, in, by the spirit instructing the soul. The soul is the seat of our will, emotions, our intellect. The body is like the mechanical frame. It moves through instructions from the spirit to the soul. 
when Adam sinned, the spirit died. That's what God said to Adam. The day you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. Adam ate of the fruit. Did he fall dead? Did we see him lying down on the ground here? Him and Eve? No. They still lived another 900 years. Was God lying? No, God was not lying. He died. When you are dead to God, you are dead. We see television shows with, with called The Walking Dead. No, no. Walking Dead are not pale, emaciated people. The world without God is a world of walking dead. That's why when we are saved, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, Paul says, And you who are dead in sin, now God has made alive. That's why the Bible says about a prostitute, she's a woman who is dead while she yet lives. When Adam sinned, the spirit died, was cut off from God, and as far as God is concerned, that is death. If you are disengaged from the Creator, once the creature is cut off from the Creator, that is death. But when the spirit died, what happened? The soul took control of the car. Can you imagine? The soul is, is the passenger. The spirit is driving the car. The spirit died, got a gunshot wound, and died. The soul opens the door and kicks him out and takes over the engine of the car. Takes over control. And so now, the body is now the servant to the soul. The body is now doing what the soul wants. The ordained pattern of God is the spirit of God that is in communion with God, receives from God, instructs the soul, the intellect, and therefore the, the instructions are passed to the body, and the body is the body performs. So both soul and bodies were servants to the spirit. Now the spirit died, the soul took control, and the soul is doing its own thing. This is why when you accept Jesus Christ, there is a war that is going on inside of you. Because that guy who was driving the car now comes back and says, this is my car, I'm taking back my position. The soul says, but I was doing okay. Where were you all this time? And the Bible says a war, the flesh lost against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Paul says, I find a law inside of me working against the law of my mind. War is going on for control. But as long as we are filled with the Spirit, the soul has to take its place and submit. And therefore the flesh and the works of the body will, will follow suit because they are now under the influence of the Spirit of the living God. That's what regeneration is all about. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, a man must be born again, it means if you're going to be saved, that spirit that died needs to be brought back to life to take control back of this vessel. Because God only comes to the spirit. Communication with God is only through the spirit. As long as man is not regenerated, as long as spirit is dead, there is no communication, there is no life. He becomes, what the Bible says, a soulish person. So if the spirit is dead, man is governed by his soul. And the composite of soul and body is what is termed in the Bible the flesh or the carnal man or a soulish person. That is the composite of life without God, without the spirit. So what is the purpose of this body? God made it. And that's the first thing we know, there's value in the body because God made it. But second reason, God divinized the body. What do I mean by that? We read a lot about, we read a lot about the philosophy of this world is that the body has no particular purpose. The major religions of this world are all towards the obliteration of the body. You talk to people in different religions, and they say, don't bother, one day we are going to get rid of this body. So karma, 
is going to, through a process of recycling, one day rid us of this body. Everyone sees this body as evil. It is a not, they say it's a Gnostic teaching. It's coming from the Gnostics who saw all things material as evil, the creation of a lesser God, a demiurge. And, and that's, that's the, but I, I suspect it goes beyond the Gnostic teachings. I suspect it started all the way in the Garden of Eden. That Eve probably said, if I didn't have a body, I would never take of that fruit. I would never grab of it. That the lust of the flesh caused me all this problem. Brought all these problems into life. And there's so there's a hatred for the body. Every religious teaching is, is towards the end. One day we will get rid of this body. One day we will become impersonal essence, whatever that means. That we won't have need of this body. But when Jesus was about to come to earth, when God was about to come to earth to redeem man, fallen man, he took a body. Hebrews chapter 2. He took the body, and he took the body of a human being, fully clothed, fully human. Here is what the Bible says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. You know why the apostle wrote this? That Jesus was made fully human in every way like us? Because there was a teaching around that time that the body is evil. The body is a creation of a lesser God. The body is not something divine. And therefore, if God was going to send his son and he was going to take his body, he could not allow divinity to be contaminated by that which is evil. So God, they were saying, these people were called the Docetists. This is, this is the group, they call themselves Docetists. And they said Jesus was not really human. He was like a tube, water passing through a tube. He was not receiving anything from his mother Mary. He did not receive the human nature from Mary. Mary was just like a shell. And imagine there was a tube that passed through her. Jesus was just inhabiting that. He was not touching. He was not a part of the genetic makeup of Mary. And so they're docetus. And the word docetus gives us this Greek word dokio, which means to appear or to seem. So they are saying Jesus seemed like a man. He appeared to be a man. But in reality, he was not really a man. But in this verse, the apostle is saying, no, no, no. He was a man, fully man in all aspects of it. He was made fully man. And if he wasn't, then he could not have redeemed man. Because by man, sin came into the world. By man, we are going to be redeemed. And in that sense, by taking on the body of a human being, Jesus added value and worth to the human body. Let me run. He came and he redeemed the human body. He redeemed the human body. Here is what 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost, who is in you, whom you received from God? You're not your own. You're bought at a price. Here is what he says now. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Hey. Honor God with your bodies. That's what the Bible says. We, we have this conceptually framed in our heads. Jesus received. Jesus redeemed my soul, my spirit, and I'm going to worship God with my spirit. And, 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 and everything, of every other aspect of me is irrelevant. You are bought with a price. And if he says, therefore glorify God in your bodies, it means he bought my soul, he bought my spirit, he bought my body. And therefore, with all of my being, 
I am to worship God. Everything was redeemed. Finally, to add to the value of the body, the Lord for the body. We're talking about the Lord for the body. He made it. He divinized it by taking it on himself. He redeemed it. And he glorified it. He glorified it. Our bodies are going to be glorified one day. But his is already glorified. And he's the first fruits of all of us. So the pattern of who he is, what he is right now, is what we're going to be like. That's what John 1, John 3, 2 says. That when he comes, when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are going to be like Jesus. And how is Jesus? Here is a mystery. An unfathomable mystery. Perhaps when we get to heaven, we will understand it. But before the creation of this world, and before the creation of humanity, God was in his holy place. And God, we know, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Bible says God is Spirit. God is Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit alone is Spirit, but God is Spirit. And God is a compound word, Elohim, for both Father, Son, for all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Father is Spirit, the Son is Spirit, the Holy Spirit is Spirit. So the Spirit Son, when man fell, Hebrews chapter 2, the Spirit Son says to the Father, man has sinned, man needs to redeem man, so make me a body, make me exactly like one of Abraham's descendants, that I will be eligible to undo the error of Adam. So, God made him a body. He became a man. But when Jesus had finished his work, and in John 17, he's praying to the Father, I'm almost done. Father, now glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. I'm ready to come home. You would think that Jesus would say, I have no need for this body anymore, and just cast it aside and return to his original spirit state. But here is the mystery. He kept the body. He kept the body. That he was able to turn to the, to the disciples and say, come touch me and see that I'm not a spirit. Put your fingers in the holes in my hands and my feet. The commingling of the divine with the human had occurred. And it was now forever going to be so. The form of the second person of the Godhead is forever altered. It's unfathomable. But the point I'm trying to make to you today is that the body is so important that Jesus decided that he was going to keep it. That he was going to keep it. So the body's for the Lord. Let me move to the second side. The Lord for the body, the body for the Lord. It follows, it's reciprocal, isn't it? That if the Lord is for my body, my body should be for the Lord. That's what the apostle is saying. If I'm for you, it is only fair that you are for me. If I give 100% to you in a relationship, it is only fair that you give me 100% back. If I give you as a friend... 100% of myself in a relationship and you are giving me 20% back, that won't work. Something is going to break down at some point. And so it makes good sense that if the Lord is for my body, that my body is going to be for the Lord. The body is for the Lord, the Lord is for the body. So how, in what sense, is my body for the Lord? When we go back now to the, to, to the diagram of the temple, and I mentioned to you that the outer court corresponds to
to the body. As we walked into the courtyard, the outer court, we ran into two, two pieces of furniture. I mentioned to you the brazen altar, and the next one was the layer of cleansing. Those two pieces we ran into. And I, I believe these two pieces of furniture are highly instructive of what it means that the body is for the Lord. The first is sacrifice. The animals were sacrificed on that altar, speaking to the cross of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of the Son of God. But Jesus is now sacrificed, and he's completed that work for us. Yet we are called to be sacrifices to the Lord, but not to be dead sacrifices, not in the sense that Jesus was crucified, because he's already accomplished that. But in Romans 12:1, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reason of a service, that we may prove that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Our bodies are meant to be a sacrifice unto God. So when I think about a body, this is a picture of what, of what the body should be doing, or what the use of the body of course, the body is used for all other purposes today. It is used for all other purposes other than glorifying God. When I think about sacrifice, I don't think about enhancement of something. I think about stripping away. You, have you ever seen, whether you see it in a movie or whether you read about it in a book, somebody's, say, whether they're sacrificing uh, an animal or they're sacrificing a child, they don't put clothes on that child. They don't put clothes on that person they're sacrificing. They're stripping them. When Jesus was sacrificed, he was stripped. He was stripped completely. He was naked. That's how he was put on the cross. Naked. Absolutely naked. That's why the soldiers were gambling over his clothes at the bottom. Before nailing him, everything was stripped off. But a crucifixion of Jesus is also instructive in terms of what it means to be a living sacrifice for God. Let's look at the crucifixion of Jesus. They're going to kill this man. They're going to put him on a cross. Right? You're going to crucify him. First of all, you're going to kill this man. That's the end of it. You're going to kill him. They could take a sword, run it through Jesus, and you kill him. But no, they put him on a, on a cross and they nailed his hands. And then they nailed his feet. And then they could have put the cross up and dropped it in the hole. And he would have been hung like the others. But was that all? Did they just nail his hands and nail his feet? They also rammed a spear through his side. And the Bible says blood and water came out. And medical doctors tell us that the only way blood and water can come out from a wound in the side is that that tip of that spear actually punctured the sack around his heart. And that's where the fluid came out from. Was that enough? They put a crown of thorns on his head, slammed it into his skull. That was only from the outside. But what was going on inside? Psalm 22, David gives us an idea. David says, I'm dried up as a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to, my, to the roof of my mouth. How is this all symbolic of what it means to give yourself a sacrifice unto the Lord? It means that my hands must be for Him. Nail my feet are for him. My heart and my emotions are for him. As the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my heart after you, O oh God. My brain, my intellect is to study him, 
His Word to serve Him. My mouth, all are surrendered to Him for His glory, for His purposes. And the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is giving us a lesson in what it means to be a sacrifice unto the Lord, that all that I am is for Him, belongs to Him. He bought me, and therefore He owns me. It's not for me to determine where I go and what I do with these hands and where these feet take me. If I'm His, then I must go where He wants me to go. And I must do what He wants me to do. And I must speak what He wants me to speak. This is why Jesus said, the words that I speak are authorized of my Father. And the deeds that I do, I have been given commandments from my Father. He never acted, He never said, He never did anything unless He was instructed, He was authorized, He was permitted. That is what it means to be a sacrifice. We are bought with a price. You're not your own. You're not your own to determine where you are going to take yourself on a, when you're supposed to be in the house of God. I will take myself here. I'll take myself there. No, no, no. The mirror. Mirror and say to yourself, you belong to Jesus. You're his property. Your hands are his. Your feet are his. Your eyes are his. Every part to be surrendered for his use. But the second thing, the second, the second instrument to be closing here, the second instrument or piece of furniture is the laver of cleansing. We're in the outer court, and we said the outer court, it corresponds to our body. And we're talking about the purpose of the body. And I want you to bear in mind, we talked about God making the human body. Of the temple, God made the temple for the holiest of all, for the holy place, and the outer court. He made it all. So while his presence comes only in the holiest of all, his presence and his instructions conducted the affairs of the holy place, the soul, and the outer court, the body. So all belong, that entire tabernacle or temple belong to God, just like your entire being belongs to God. But after sacrifice is purification, cleansing. We are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in our bodies. Glorify God in our bodies. A good example of what it means to glorify God in the body, to be purified, Perhaps an illustration would help us to, to contextualize what it means, purification of the outer court of the body. The Bible tells us when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, you remember the story after he got the donkey and he rode into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday? When he came in, the Bible says the day after, he went to the Father's house and he saw people People conducting business in the courtyard. Remember, this is in the body. Okay, This is the courtyard, the outer court. All this business is being conducted. They were selling doves. They were selling sheep. They were changing money. And Jesus took some action. He overturned the money changers' table. And he drove all the merchants out. And he says, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. A den of thieves. And he drove them all out. Keep, keep the picture in mind. This is the outer court. This is the body. It wasn't, they weren't in the holy place or in the holy of all. They were in the outer court. This was what's happening. I also want you to keep in mind, you know, whenever we think about Jesus coming into the temple yard and chasing all these people out, we think that they were doing a lot of evil things. Well, on the face of it, it was evil, but not the way we normally think of it. The picture, certainly, that I used to get is, oh, lots of wicked stuff used to be going on, and Jesus got so angry, he just picked up a whip 
and chased all these people out. What they were doing, listen to me, what those people were doing was on the face of it, legitimate. People were coming to offer sacrifices in the outer court. That's where the priests took the sacrifices. And these people were selling the doves. So you had visitors coming from foreign countries, People come from all over, and they were not going to stop somewhere to buy a dove. They came, and they bought the dove right in the courtyard and brought it to the priest who sacrificed it. What about the money changes? What were they doing? The money changes were changing money for people coming with different currency from different places. They were making change for them because... Everyone entering the temple had to bring what is called a temple offering. Just like we come to church and we bring an offering. You went into the temple and they had to bring a temple offering. As you see the woman, the widow with the mite, casting her her denarii or her mite into, into the offering. They had to bring an offering. So people came. And these people were making change for them, were exchanging currency. They were selling them if you need a sheep or you need a dove. So the business that they were carrying on was legitimate to the point that the priests did not see anything wrong with it to tell them what you're doing is wrong. So why Jesus came and turned everything upside down and chased these people out? Because listen to me, they were, their motives were wrong. These were people who were using religion to enhance themselves. They were making money off the brokering, of the changing of the currency for the people. They were overcharging the people for all the sacrificial animals. It had moved away from the spirit of religion and piety and it had become a business. And a lot of what is being done today in the church takes shelter under the robe of religion, but the motives are ulterior. They are for the enhancement of ourselves has nothing to do with the glory of God. The body is for the Lord. The soul is for the Lord. The spirit is for the Lord. That's what God wants us to know and what the apostle wants us to know. The Lord for the body. The body for the Lord. Is the Lord for your body today? Or is your body yours to do with as you please? This body is not for enhancement, it's for stripping down. In the United Arab Emirates, the cosmetics and cosmetic surgery is $60,000 a year. Enhancing the body, putting six to mud. For dust we are, and on the dust we are going to return. This is going to return, this outer shell. And we say, ah, oh, thousand dollars? Well, they're all rich people, probably all, they're all million. And here's the sad thing. If in the West we had that kind of money, next to, we don't have that kind of money. I turn on television, and three things you're seeing all the time. You know them. Cars? Food, cosmetics. Hmm? In this scripture, Paul is saying that you are saying the stomach for food and food for the stomach, God will destroy both. That's not a purpose of the body. The advertisements on TV make us feel that that's the purpose of the body. Food, cosmetics. The body is for the Lord. Be sacrificed for the Lord, for his glory. Amen.